Of course, we're streaming live, and so we welcome all of you uh, today. Um, I'm looking at the pews, and there's no one here. So this is a unique experience uh, for all of us, for me, but for all of us, um, to stay at home and watch this online. And of course, we're doing this because of the um, recommendations, the strong recommendations from health officials and government officials and obviously our church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church officials, to uh, not have these uh, public services. And I say in-person services because we're still doing a public service. Um, I just have to speak to a screen and you're on the other side of the screen. So I want to say hello to all of our uh, Tempe Adventist members and to the guests that are joining us today. And I really want to thank um, those gentlemen behind the camera, Stephen and Robert, who put this together. And we do have, we are going to sing some songs. So we do have a pianist here, Joel Martinez, is joining us. And so you'll hear that. There he is. So you have to say hello there. <laughs> so he is uh, joining us. And we are going to have some songs. And um, the way we're going to do this today is it looks very much different. The, the service is going to have a different feel to it simply because we don't have all of the elements um, you know, children's story, etc. Uh, but we're going to start with some songs, and then I do have some more remarks and church announcements that I want to make. And we actually have the songs on the letters on the screen for you. So um, if you have a hymnal at home, I would invite you to turn to your hymn to number 524, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. And so let's go ahead and sing the first, second, and fourth stanzas of this song. Sing it with all your heart. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus and to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise and to know, thus saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood, and in simple faith to plunge beneath the healing cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust thee, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that thou art with me, wilt be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Amen. I hope you're saying amen at home. Um, the songs that we have chosen for this morning all have to do with trusting in Jesus and hoping in Jesus. This next song is number 214, We Have This Hope. I love this song. We Have This Hope. So sing along with us at home, wherever you are. We Have This Hope, number 214. Sing it along, sing loud. We have this hope that burns within our heart. Hope in the coming of the Lord. We have this 
faith that Christ alone imparts, faith in the promise of His Word. We believe the time is here when the nations far and near shall awake and shout and sing hallelujah christ is king we have this hope that burns within our heart hope in the coming of the lord and everyone said Amen. 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 Faith is the victory. This is how we overcome the world through the faith that we have in Jesus, the faith of Jesus. And so I invite you to sing along with all of your hearts. Faith is the victory. Hymn number 608. We're going to sing the first and the second stanzas only. Let's sing it. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise, and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Sing it. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. On every hand in fields we drawn up in tread of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith a like whirlwind's breath swept on o'er every field. The faith by which they conquer death is still our shining shield. Let's sing it, everyone. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. Amen. Amen. Just when I need him most in times like these, whether it's a, a virus or whether we're just going through him in the ups and in the downs, and we're going to finish our song service with this song, Just When I Need Him Most, the first, second, and fourth stanza of hymn number 512. Sing with, along with us, look at the screen, and let's sing it now. Joel, thank you. Just when I need Him, Jesus is near. Just when I falter, just when I fear, ready to help me, ready to cheer, just when I need Him most, just, just when I need Him most, just when I need Him most, Jesus is near to comfort and cheer, just when I need him most. Second stanza. Just when I need him, Jesus is true. Never forsaking all the way through. Giving for burdens, pleasures anew. Just when I need him most. Just when I need him most. Just when I need Him most, Jesus is near to comfort and cheer. 
Just when I need him most. Last stanza. Just when I need him, he is my all. Answering when upon him I call. Tenderly watching lest I should fall. Just when I need him most. Sing it out. Just when I need him most. Just when I need him most. Jesus is near to comfort and cheer. Just when I need him most. Amen. Applause for Jesus and all the good things that he does for us and his blessings for us every single day. We cannot doubt or waver in our trust in him. You know, sometimes we do. Um, but Jesus is always there, and he's always there to comfort us and strengthen us and give us the peace uh, that we need in our hearts. The Bible says, not as the world gives, but as Jesus gives. Well, I want to share with you some church news, and before I do, before I forget, um, I'm holding a bulletin here. This is our latest uh, bulletin, and you can find this bulletin every week as a PDF on our church website, tempeadventist.com. And uh, so our webmaster, Jacqueline, I thank you so much for doing all of this. Um, she did a fantastic job, by the way. If you have gone on our website, she put this there, she put that there. And so just a shout out for Jacqueline Van Sant for doing all of this for us, Jacqueline. Um, thank you so much. Um, but you will find our PDF bulletin if you go to our website, and it'll be updated every week. And um, so I'm not sure if it's there yet. We got it uh, a little bit late to Jacqueline. Um, but uh, I want to share some uh, news for you, uh, some of the things you already know, obviously, um, about the church closures valley-wide, statewide, I should say, and nationwide and worldwide. Um, just, just this morning, I was looking on the internet. I was asking myself, what about these mega churches? I looked at the Saddleback Community Church. This is Rick Warren's church, Joel Osteen's church, these big mega churches that are non-Adventist, uh, Joseph Prince's church, um, Bishop T.D. Jakes, the Potter's House in uh, Texas, all of these mega churches are having their uh, services online. And of course, we're no exception. And um, so um, the COVID virus, um, as again, we've been announcing in our church, uh, if you are sick or coughing or feverish, um, I know there's, I'm getting conflicting information as far as testing is available, testing is not available, but if you're sick, get tested and stay home, and just please remember to practice those precautionary measures that health officials are telling us to wash your hands. If you happen to go out and you have to go shopping, um, when you come home, you know, wash your hands, uh, use hand sanitizer, wipe things down. When you go into the supermarket, you know, Walmart and these other places, they'll have those wipies. Sometimes they're completely out of those wipies. But use those wipies to wipe down the handle of those shopping carts um, before you go shopping. And, uh, but anyways, just be safe. We have faith in God, et cetera, but be safe. Um, our Tempe activities have uh, been canceled such as our blood drive, which uh, was going to take place on uh, April the 11th, if I'm not mistaken. But we do encourage you to look up a local American Red Cross or United Blood Services and donate blood anyways, because we're hearing on the news that because everybody is just staying indoors and people are working out of their homes now, um, the blood supplies are running very, if not they are very low, and so they are urging us to continue to give blood. And so I'm saying this on behalf of uh, Susan Cruz, our um, community services director. Please give, uh, give blood anyway uh, at your local uh, blood bank. Uh, the tithes and offerings today are for our local church budget. So let me talk about how we're doing tithes and offerings. If you go on our website, our church website, tempeadventist.com, um, you can give online. If you scroll all the way to the bottom of the page, there was at the top of the page, I think that's taken off, but if you scroll all the way to the bottom, click on online giving, and you can give your, of course you'll have to use a, a, a debit or credit card, you can give online. The other two ways to do this is to just come here to church and drop off your uh, tithe envelopes 
or an, um, if you don't have a tithe envelope, a, a regular envelope and inside write a note what the tithes are for or how much uh, is your tithe, how much are your offerings. Uh, please make a check. Don't deposit cash in our mail slot. It is a secure uh, box. So I'm pointing to my right hand side, which is the east side of our building. Um, so if you go to the east side, towards the front, there's a slot and it says letters. It's steel, it's secure. Drop off your check there. The third way to do it is just mail it into our church, uh, 41 East 13th Street in Tempe, Arizona. Because of this COVID 19 uh, issue, uh, that we're all aware about. I'm doing a new sermon series that is designed just for these times. It's called These Empty Pews Are Full. I literally, besides Stephen and Robert behind the camera, there's literally three people in our congregation. <laughs> and I'm looking at them right now, so thank you for coming, um, my wife included. But um, <clears throat> I forgot what I was going to say about the COVID-19. Um, our, our new sermon series, yes. So today it's called Christ in Crisis. Next week it is called COVID-19 and the Apocalypse. And then uh, on the third Sabbath from today, um, it is called Castles in the Air. And this is designed specifically for these times. So that's the new sermon series. And um, I also want to remind you that we are doing for the first time, at least I'm doing this for the first time in this church, we are doing Zoom gatherings. What Zoom is... Uh, is an online platform where you can see each other if you click video you can see each other on a computer screen or on your phone or you can just hear each other um, audio and we can have live meetings still via modern technology sometimes we knock modern technology and the social media and there's some things that are unfortunate in that but in this case we are very fortunate to have social media such as zoom so if you go to our church website, and if you, if you look under announcements, there is a subtitle under announcements. It's called Online on Tuesdays and Fridays. If you click on that, that'll give you all of the instructions on how to join us on Zoom. So Friday nights at 7 p.m., we did one just last night, and Tuesday night prayer meetings, we are continuing via Zoom. So go on to our website, um, and then you will find all of the instructions there. Okay, so um, we're going to continue with our service today. Um, I want to have an opening prayer, so would you bow your heads with me, and let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath day. We thank you, God, that you are alive and well. You are the sovereign of this planet. We know, God, that you are directing the affairs of, of this world. Things that are happening here did not take you by surprise. It took us by surprise and how rapidly uh, things are taking place. But you're not caught off guard because you know things from the beginning to the end. So we praise you. We thank you, God, that we can place our utmost trust in you, that this world is not stopping or uh, chaotic because you are absent. We know that you're here. We thank you for that. We thank you for the Sabbath that we can momentarily put all of the news reports aside and we can focus on you and our worship of you and our Lord and Savior Jesus. Lord, I pray that you will bless all of those guests and members who are watching right now from their homes on their computer screens, television screens, on their phones. I pray, Lord, that your blessing will transmit through these uh, wireless uh, waves and that you will bless all of us. And Lord, I not only pray for our Tempe service today, I want to pray for all of our Adventist churches who are online right now, all over the world. We pray for your rich blessing, which is no less than... Uh, the fact that we're watching online. Lord, we do pray for this uh, virus pandemic. We pray that it will come to an end. We pray that you will give us compassion, help us to be safe, and please be with those, Lord, who have lost loved ones. Comfort them and be close to them. So bless our uh, message at this time. Give us your Holy Spirit. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. 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 
All right, so um, this morning's message is entitled Christ During Crisis. Christ During Crisis. And I'm going to go ahead and take a seat. By the way, you notice the, the uh, platform behind me. We kind of spiffed it up in preparation for uh, the service. And if you notice behind me, there's some words. I'm going to give this hymnal to my lovely wife here. If you notice behind me... Um, <clears throat> There's this word, faith, uh, and so keep that in mind during all of this. And of course, over here, it is well with my soul. Amen? I hope it is well with your soul. Um, it is well with my soul. And um, we are going to continue to celebrate our Lord's love and guidance and providence and His provisions every single day, no matter what happens. Christ during crisis. I want to share just a very quick experience with you. Some of you have heard this. Some of you have not heard this. Um, years ago, my wife and I um, had foster children. Some of you may have foster children, so um, we identify with those of you who have uh, foster children. Years ago, we had foster children, and uh, we were living in a very small apartment at the time, and the, the state, the social worker, had uh, accepted our limited living conditions. We had three girls plus our own son, and this was in California. Well, the rules state that certain genders and uh, uh, a limited amount of children per room, uh, we, we just could not uh, abide to those rules, and she knew that because we lived in a small apartment. And uh, so it came a point where our lease was going to end and we were looking for a house, a bigger place to live to, in an attempt to comply with the California state laws in regards to foster children. You know, only two max can be in a bedroom. You can't mix a male and a female, that type of thing. And uh, so we didn't renew our lease and for months ahead of time, we were looking for a home. We were looking and looking and looking. We asked church members to help us. Some church members, in fact, offered to open their home to us, but that just wouldn't work out. It wouldn't abide by the state uh, regulations. So we kept on looking left and right in newspapers, and I, um, I think I purchased a list of homes available and then made calls left and right. Nothing was happening. Absolutely uh, running into a, a dead end all the time. The day came when we had to move from the apartment. We couldn't renew the lease. It had been rented already. The day came that we had to move out. So I picked up a, a U-Haul and uh, had a couple of the youth from our church um, help me load up furniture. And as you know, and back then we had landlines. I know landlines still exist, of course, but um, the, one of the last things you do when you move from one place to another is you disconnect your phone. That's the very last thing you do is you disconnect your phone. And so the living room was empty, things were empty, and we were loading up the U-Haul, the phone was still on, and I did not, we did not know where we were going. We had tried everything we could. We had prayed, and we tried everything we could. Members helping us and making calls and leaving messages, et cetera, et cetera. Um, nothing. And I'm leaving out some details, so you might be thinking, well, did you try this? Probably. I'm just trying to cut short my testimony here. We tried everything. We literally did not know we were going, but we had to load up. And all of a sudden, the phone call came. The phone call. The phone rings and I answer it. And he says, uh, are you so-and-so? Yes, I am. Are you still interested in the house? I said, well, which house is this? He described the location of the house I could not remember leaving a message for this gentleman. I couldn't remember this, this house. I did not remember. I asked, well, it, it's, it's available? He says, well, yes. And I explained my circumstances, um, having my wife, four small children, not knowing where to go. Um, and uh, he said, yes, it's available. So I said, can we come and see it right now? He says, sure, we can, I can be there in about 15 minutes. So we drove about 15, 20 minutes, uh, less than that, and we looked at this home, and it was the perfect home. Now, mind you, before that phone call, 
um, a couple of weeks and weeks leading up to that day when we had to move, we were stressing out. We were stressing out. I remember parking in a parking lot someplace and uh, we just didn't know what to do. And uh, my wife started crying and um, we just held hands and we started to pray, God, please help us. This was some time before. So we go to the house. This house had the number of bedrooms we needed. This house had a garage I desperately wanted uh, because where the apartment where we were, I had my home office in my garage. No heating, no air conditioning, so I was, it was horrible. Um, the house was beautiful. It lay uh, in the middle of uh, 68 acres of walnut and almond trees. Beautiful, beautiful. I explained the situation to this gentleman that was there, and he said, you know what, forget the credit check. Just give me a check for the first month's rent, and you guys are good to go. And he gave me the keys. We are just praising the Lord. And this is what happened. This is how Jesus provides for us. What he said was that he, was, he came home from a big event, and he called all of the people that had left messages. We were the last on the list, about number 10. Nobody answered the phone except me. Nobody answered the phone except me. And that's how we got this home. And then later, he tells us he was managing the property for these um, out-of-state, the out-of-state owners. We met the owners about a couple of months later, and they said they had been praying for a young couple with children, these were Christians, to rent a home from them. It was just, I have to leave out some details, it was perfect. And so, God understands that we go through stressful times, but he provides for us. Now, let me transition into, let's talk about Jesus a little bit. Did you know that Jesus knows crisis personally? Christ knows crisis personally. I want to share some uh, verses with you. Um, <clears throat> he himself experienced circumstances that were very, very stressful. So let me give you a few examples. In Luke chapter 4, verses 28 and 29. You can write this down at home and then look up the references, uh, look up the passages later. People were, church people, mind you, were wanting to kill him at the very outset of his ministry. For example, the Bible says, all the people in the synagogue were filled with rags as they heard these things, and they got up and drove him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built. In order to throw him down the cliff, so I don't know if people have ever, after you, after your life, and wanted to, you know, rub you out, but that could cause a certain amount of, of stress and anxiety, but this is what happened to Jesus. Also, the strong attacks of Satan upon Jesus at his weakest moment, at his weakest moment, um, the temptations when Jesus was alone. In fact, if you think about it, Jesus was alone. If Jesus would have succumbed to these temptations, nobody would have found out, at least immediately. He was all alone. But Jesus maintained his integrity. The book of Matthew chapter 4 says, And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he became hungry and the tempter uh, came to him. His best friend Lazarus had died. And the Bible says that Jesus cried. And his friends were blaming him for the fact that Lazarus had died. Uh, Mary told him, and this is in John chapter 11, Mary told him, Jesus, if you, hadn't, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. If you'd been here. And so they were, they're laying on all of the, uh, trying to make a, put a guilt trip on Jesus himself. And this coming from his best friends that lived in Bethany. I would say that Jesus knows uh, that type of crisis personally. The religious leaders were plotting to kill Jesus when he resurrected Lazarus from the dead. And uh, this was a foolproof uh, evidence that Jesus was the Messiah, and so they wanted to get rid of him. And the Bible actually says this in John 11, verses, uh, verses 5, or verse 5, or excuse me, verse 54, Therefore Jesus no longer continued to walk publicly among the Jews, but went away from there to the country near the wilderness, and so when Jesus uh, got word that, hey, they're, they're after you, they're, they want to kill you, 
Jesus left. He had to stop his ministry in that particular locale. Um, just a couple more examples. Jesus' last week. He experienced torture, and more troubling was the fact that his disciples abandoned him. In Mark 14, 50, the Bible says, and they all left him and fled. And of course, Jesus tasted death for everybody on the cross. He became sin, even though he did not know sin uh, through experience or through deeds. In fact, he was so much in agony of spirit and, and heart that he... He looks up towards heaven and he says, God, why have you forsaken me? That was probably, uh, and of course, before that, in the Garden of Gethsemane, his, him um, sweating, actually sweating blood. There's a medical, there's a, that was an actual uh, real medical phenomenon that happens very rarely. But Jesus knows crisis personally. He knows by experience the trials and temptations of humanity. So let me give you two lessons of all of this that I have just shared with you. Lesson number one, Jesus is seasoned in troubles. Jesus is seasoned in troubles. You know, some may say, well, you know, how can Jesus know what I'm going through? How can he possibly know? Or doesn't God know what it's like to et cetera, et cetera? Jesus is seasoned in troubles. He knows what it is like to live through crisis. In fact, the stress points that he experienced, the temptations, the hardships, surpass anything, I believe, surpass anything by far that we will go through in this life. Um, the, the, the attacks and the pointing of the finger and the abandonment, and the misunderstanding, and the hard hearts that he had to deal with, and of course the persecutions. Nobody has ever experienced um, this duress and stress and um, just suffering that our Lord Jesus has. He was the center of attacks like no other being has ever been in the history of mankind. I strongly believe this. So lesson number one, Jesus is seasoned in troubles. Lesson number two, Jesus is the savior of troubles. Jesus is savior of troubles. That's number two. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean all the time that Jesus will save you out of troubles because we all have them, don't we? I know, I, if I can see you right now, I know you're nodding your head. We all have those troubles. The best of the best in the Bible experience troubles, persecution, disappointments, um, moments of failure. They've all experienced that. So lesson number two, Jesus is the Savior of troubles. I love this promise in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Don't you love that? We can come to the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It doesn't say in time of ease. It says in time of need. We will all experience those times of need and we can come to Jesus with confidence. So troubles may come our way, such as this coronavirus and all the unrest and disturbance that it is leaving in its wake, such as death, obviously, um, financial hardships, physical disconnection, physical disconnection from each other, toilet paper shortages, empty streets, empty pews. <laughs> uh, welcome to the new normal. This is our new normal for, for the time. But Jesus is Savior of troubles. Now, I just shared a few words with you with that, but let me go into that a little bit further because what does that actually mean Jesus is Savior of our troubles? Well, let me share with you what it does not mean first, and then I'll share with you what it does mean. This is what it doesn't mean. That Jesus will save you when you are a troublemaker. <laughs> when you're a troublemaker, either self-inflicted nonsense or when you spread strife and suffering towards others. Um, now, I get it. Jesus is merciful even when we do cause troubles you know, and bring them in by our own actions and foolishness into our own lives and then others are affected. 
and then we ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins. I understand that, Jesus, but um, what I'm talking about is if we are um, troublemakers, I don't believe that we can automatically, by default, expect Jesus to bless and guide us and flood us with the light of his love when we're purposefully being troublemakers. So that's, that's what I mean, and I think we'll all agree with that. So that's what it doesn't mean. It also doesn't mean that we can anticipate Jesus to save us, but we lay dormant and inactive and inoperative. So what do I mean by that? Well, let me give you an example. Moses' mom asked God for help, but what did she do? She weaved a basket together, or at least she got an old laundry basket, and she put baby Moses in there, and she did something about it. She just didn't sit on her hands and wait for God to do something without her action or in the midst of her inactivity. The Israelite army asked God for help, but they had to march Jericho around for a whole week. David asked for help, but he had to go and confront Goliath face to face. In fact, the Bible says that he ran to Goliath. So faith in Christ, faith in God has meat and bones to it. It is a pragmatic faith that is demonstrated by works, not foolish or presumptuous idleness. In fact, James chapter 2, verse 22 says um, that faith is perfected or completed by our works. So this is what um, Jesus saving us from our troubles. This is what it doesn't mean. Here's what it does mean. That Jesus is strong to give us a sense and presence of hope, of peace, of perspective, of keeping our marbles when trials hit. Just keeping our sanity. Even David recognized that we will go through uh, the valley of the shadow of death, but Christ will make us fear no evil, for you are with me. Now, Christ accompanies us through these down times. I think we all know that. Christ is with us. In a, uh, he's our present help in time of need through the trials. But he keeps our faith strong and he keeps our hearts from failing from fear or from abject confusion. So when we experience times of dilemma and difficulty and disturbance and our routines are disturbed and we have to adjust because of the COVID-19, God will help us keep spiritual and mental composure. This is what it means when Jesus is the savior of our troubles. He will help us to keep that composure. But the other meaning of this is that Jesus will save us from impending doom. Now earlier I said, not all the time. I can, always, I can only think of um, those poor martyrs who kept their faith in times of persecution, and uh, yet they were martyred. Um, but this is God's promise that he will save us from impending doom, but it is usually, in fact, always conditioned upon our loving obedience to him. And of course, the classic text to this is Psalm chapter 91. So I want to invite you to open up your Bibles, and I have it right here. Let's, let's read Psalm 91. I want to read a few verses. Psalm chapter 91 Starting with verse 1. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Amen? My God in whom I trust. Amen. For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly, what? Pestilence. That's what it says. He will deliver us from the pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions that's his wings, and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and bulwark. You will not be afraid of the terror by night or of the arrows that uh, flies, uh, the, the arrow that flies by day or the pestilence that stalks, stalks in darkness or of the destruction. The Bible says a thousand in verse seven, a thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, it shall not approach you. Verse 10 says, No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. And then later it says, God will send His angels, Amen. His innumerable angels, to guard you, lest you... And in fact, this is the same verse that uh, Satan tempted Christ with. If you look at um, verse 12, They will bear you up in their hands that you do not strike your foot against <clears throat> excuse me, against a stone. In other words, they will protect you. So the Bible 
um, when Jesus is Savior of our troubles, the Bible does say that he will save us from the pestilence, from the plague. So we can bank on that promise. So even though Christ may save us from this pestilence or plague, however, and some Christians are calling this the COVID-19 a plague, this still doesn't mean to be smug about putting faith into practice. That's not what that means. The plague here in Psalm 91, in fact, reminds us of the plague of death on the eve the Israelites were to experience the great exodus from Egyptian slavery. The angel of death came and struck the Egyptians that didn't have faith in God, that did not, um, uh, that did not submit to his power and his grace after plague after plague after plague revealed to them who the true God really was. Um, that angel of death came and struck them with this plague. But that angel of death, that plague was for everyone. Those that were saved had to do something in loving obedience to God. They had to go and uh, pick up a, a perfect uh, sheep and kill it at twilight and put the blood over their doors. And when that angel of destruction, that plague angel came and saw what they did, the steps they took by faith, to save them from this plague of death. They saw that blood that was covering their home, so to speak, because they believed that it would cover them. And uh, it passed over the, uh, those homes that had applied that blood. And in fact, I don't have time to go over this, but when we talk about having faith in Christ and believing in Christ, it is not just a mere, um, I believe in Jesus, and yet your hands and your feet and your thoughts and your lips um, as I said earlier, are inoperative. There are steps to take. We have our human part in loving obedience to Christ. And even, in fact, even before we come to Christ, for those of you who are contemplating on following Jesus and accepting him as Lord and Savior, if you've never done this before, and you may have tuned in at this moment, in fact, 30 seconds ago, and you're hearing me say this right now, Jesus Christ offers his salvation to anyone who believes. This is what John 3.16 says. Anyone, regardless of what religion you may have in your background, regardless of your gender, regardless of your culture, regardless of who you are, as long as you have red blood flowing through your veins, Jesus offers salvation to you. But there are steps to Christ to take if you are to take advantage of this free salvation gift that he offers to you, and that what some of those steps are repentance, um, admitting to yourself, you do need salvation, and it's not going to originate from inside of you. There is repentance to do, and there is an act of faith. There is a step of faith that you need to take to come to Christ, and that is believing you may not all have all the I's dotted and the T's crossed and understanding what all the Bible is about, but if you believe that Jesus can save you from your sins, that's a step you need to take uh, to Christ. Um, <clears throat> let me uh, start this transition into the second portion of my message for you, and that is the pandemic that we're all experiencing now. I'm not talking about necessarily the COVID-19. It is wreaking havoc in our society. We need to be careful and we need to be wise. We need to exercise those things that we're told by the experts to do, you know, hand sanitation and staying home if, if sick, it's, it's keeping distance from others, et cetera, et cetera. And a, pan, a, a pandemic like this is going to have its effect on, it's going to play tricks on our mind, on our emotions and our, 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 our thoughts. In fact, it's going to be interesting if this thing rides out for longer. What I am curious about is how it's going to affect um, our, our minds. Um, it's going to have some type of effect. The fact that we're empty here, that we have to stay at home, that we're disengaged from each other in the physical uh, sense. There's, there's got to be some type of effects of that psychologically. That's what this pandemic is doing. But though COVID-19 should be you know, respected and not foolheartedly messed with, we need to be aware of an equally dangerous pandemic, albeit in the emotional and spiritual realm, and that is the pandemic of fear. The pandemic of fear. Because of the fear that the coronavirus 
is, is doing. The, CD, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, it has some things, uh, lists some things that can happen. Let me share these with you. Um, fear and worry about your health and the health of your loved ones. Um, I think all of us, my wife and myself, we're always praying. My son, um, he, he works for hospice. He's a CNA for hospice. And so those who are ministering to others, caregivers, um, they can be exposed to this virus. That is going to cause a certain amount of stress. Like my wife and I, we're not stressing out, as they say, but we're concerned. We pray for our son. We, we tell him in a non-nagging way, son, please take care of yourself. And he's doing all he can. Um, we're worried about the health of our loved ones, especially those of us who have children. Um, it may cause changes in your sleeping or in your eating patterns, is what the CDC is listing. Difficulty sleeping or concentrating. Um, worsening of chronic health problems. Increased use of alcohol, tobacco, or other drugs. These could be some of the side effects of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. In fact, let me tell you something that just happened just this last week. My wife and I went to the store, the supermarket, and in some supermarkets, you will see a florist section. They have flowers in the refrigeration and, and the balloons and the flowers. And I intentionally just uh, told myself, go smell the flowers. I did that. And uh, so we were in that section near the produce where the flowers are, and I went and I literally just wanted to take my mind off of this COVID-19. And I literally just started smelling the flowers and I looked very closely at them intentionally and it was just admiring the beauty of the flowers. In fact, my wife then joined me and we were smelling the flowers. She says, look, smell this one. And so we just took a three minute vacation from COVID-19 and it was a good thing. And then what came to our minds was of course what Jesus says, not even Solomon was arrayed like one of these flowers. And so one of the things that we can do to support yourself and to deal with this is to just take a break from all of this and smell the flowers. I was telling somebody the other day, <clears throat> if you're trapped at home and you can't go to work, um, moment, you know, periodically go outside, go for a walk around the block, or just look up in the sky and just thank God and suck in that oxygen and look at the blue sky and the clouds and the sun and get your mind off of these other things. So let me share you some of the things that you can support um, uh, yourself and your family. Continue, number one, continue your devotional time with God. Continue your prayers. Continue your Bible reading. We have to be anchored um, in those moments that we spend alone uh, with Christ. The other one, as I just mentioned this, take breaks from watching, reading, or listening to these news stories, including social media, um, and just take a break and focus on something else. If you have a little, if you have puzzles or uh, um, uh, one of those, you have to find the words that are scrambled, uh, I don't know what they call them, crosswords or, or something, just do something. Or for those of you who like to sew or do, do something to get your mind off of these things. Um, the other thing I want to mention is take care of your body. Take care of your body. Um, many of us, are familiar with this acronym New Start. Um, it's eight letters in this word New Start, and it means nutrition. The E stands for exercise. The W stands for water. The S, the first S, stands for sunlight. The, the, the T stands for uh, temperance. The A stands for air. The R stands for rest. And then the, uh, um, the T, the last T, starts, uh, um, signifies uh, trust in God. By practicing these things, um, your immune system will, will boost itself and you will be less susceptible to catching any virus or anything because your immune system <coughs> is strong because of the lifestyle that you're adapting, uh, these eight healthy uh, habits that you can do for your own life. Um, make time to unwind, do other activities, connect with others, talk with people, call them on the phone. And last what I have here is have an attitude of gratitude. Thank God every day for living, for salvation, for the things that He has given you, for the blessings that He pours out on you. Have this attitude of gratitude. For those of you who have children, 
um, and looking up various sources uh, this week, children and teens react in part from how they see adults reacting around them. Um, sometimes we, you know, we just give them the lead and they respond uh, appropriately. So when parents and caregivers deal with COVID-19 calmly and confidently, um, you can provide the best support in that way for your children. Um, we as parents can be m more reassuring to those around our, uh, around our children. And so it's good to inform ourselves, but not to um, behave and speak in a way that our children are seeing panic and anxiety in us as parents. Not all children or teens are going to respond the same way uh, to stress, obviously. Um, but here's some common changes to watch for. And I don't remember what website I got this from, but I thought this is pretty good stuff. Here's some uh, changes um, uh, to watch out for. If your children, of course, depending on their age and of course their individual makeup, excessive crying or irritation in younger children. Um, you know, mommy, what's this virus? And they may get all stressed out because you're stressed out. But um, it's, if there's excessive crying, returning to behaviors they have outgrown, for example, toileting accidents or, or bedwetting, that may be a sign that your children are under this, uh, going through this duress. Excessive worry or sadness, unhealthy eating or sleeping habits, irritability and acting out behaviors in teens, um, poor school performance. Of course, many of the schools are closed now. Um, difficulty with attention and concentration. I can just hear some of you parents saying, well, that's my teen anyways. <laughs> but that may be on the increase. Um, unexplained headaches or body pain, use of alcohol, tobacco, or drugs. Um, just keep an eye on your children. and There's ways that you can support them. Um, take time to talk with them, uh, with your teens about this outbreak. Read the Bible together and pray together as a family. Um, I'm thinking in our, in our very own church, um, we have families with uh, multiple children and, um, you know, read together and pray together. Reassure your child or teen that they are safe. Let them know that it is okay if they feel upset. Talk things out. Don't just scold them and say, oh, be quiet. It's nothing. Um, listen to them and talk, uh, talk to them and be a role model. Take breaks, get plenty of sleep, exercise, eat well, connect with your friends and family members. Be a role model for your children at home during this time of crisis. Again, if this prolongs, and we just don't know, there's lots of things that are unknowns, but if this prolongs, um, again, as I said, for now, this is our new normal. And so we're going to have to adjust um, our daily activities, and we're going to have to really keep a guard on our thoughts and how we're handling these things as Christians. Um, we're going to be posting on our website um, a PDF that has um, six promises. We made them available here in our very own foyer just last week when, you, when we had our service. Six amazing promises of God of how to uh, keep you buoyed up through this crisis. But we're going to be posting those on our website very, very soon. My title this morning, let me come to a close, is Christ in Crisis. I want to encourage you that are listening um, to keep hope in God, keep faith in God. Um, we are human beings. We are naturally, uh, we naturally can fall into anxiety and stress and, and worry. Um, these are the things that we have to live with and cope and manage. And by faith and trusting in God, while we are not uh, you know, stagnant in our own works, but we're doing what we can, then leave the rest to God. Keep faith in God, and that'll give you strength. That'll give you strength in your mind. That'll give you strength in your spirit and your heart uh, during this COVID-19 crisis. The, um, the series that I'm preaching again is called These Empty Pews Are Full. Now, let me tell you why I'm saying that. There's only three people besides our camera guys there's only three people in the sanctuary right now. But if as believers, as Christians, as those who love the Lord with all of our hearts and we're praying and depending on Jesus and uh, during these times, you're actually filling yourself up. We're praying for the Holy Spirit every day. 
And even though I'm preaching to empty pews, I know you're out there. I know you're listening to me. I know that you can be full of God's grace, full of his presence, full of the peace that he gives to us, even a peace that surpasses all understanding, Philippians chapter 4 tells us. If we give all of our anxieties and if we unload and vent on our Lord Jesus Christ in faith and in trust, he will put that peace in our hearts that the world cannot give you, but that only Jesus can give you. And in that sense, even though you're here and the pew is empty where you usually sit, you can be full of his grace and his presence. So I invite you to always trust in him. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you so very much for being the Christ in this crisis. We pray, God, and I pray for everyone who is watching and listening to me right now that you will grace them with your loving and powerful presence, that you will provide for our needs when there's lots of shelves that are empty in the grocery stores, that you will provide for our needs. And not only that, Lord, but we know from your word that those of us who have plenty, we are obligated to share with those who have less. This is our privilege to be generous and benevolent with the goods that we have. So give us a compassionate heart. We not only want to pray for others in need, but if we can help supply those needs, Lord, then by your grace, we want to take action. Lord Jesus, no matter if a church is full or empty, as many of our churches worldwide, we know, Jesus, that nothing can keep you from ministering to us, for providing for us, for giving us power and direction and guidance. We thank you for this, Jesus. Continue to be the Christ in this crisis for us. For we ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, may God bless you and keep you. And we'll see you um, on Tuesday night. If you go to our website, tempeadventist.com, under the announcement section, click on that Tuesday and Friday subtitle, and it'll give you instructions on how to Zoom. I'll be just right from my own home. And so we'll see you on, we'll see you on Zoom Tuesday at 7 o'clock, and then Friday at 7 o'clock, same time. And then, of course, next Sabbath for our online streaming uh, like we're doing this morning. God bless you, and have a happy Sabbath.